Ladies and gents, I am the one and only DJ Storms. Welcome back to the channel here on YouTube.com. It is, of course, Monday, December 7th, 2020. We are a week into the month of December. We are getting ready to start a new week of wrestling programming, and we are wrapping up a busy weekend for the DJ Storms brand, a busy weekend for many content creators, as we are wrapping up NXT TakeOver War Games 2020 weekend. We got a lot of material to discuss for NXT, and it really does suck. It really does suck because... I really don't want to complain. I really don't want to complain. I don't want to start off on a negative note. Because that's really not who I am when it comes to NXT. Especially especially since it was a great show that we saw last night. There was a lot of good on the show. A lot of great wrestling. A lot of storyline advancement. Some of it good. Some of it bad. Of course, we got Monday Night Raw tonight. This video is not related to anything Monday Night Raw, depending on how you look at it. But regardless, this is the rewind for NXT TakeOver War Games 4, which of course streamed live on the WWE Network last night with the show starting at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. We got a fairly enjoyable three-hour wrestling show. We got a lot to talk about. We got five matches to dissect. We got a lot of talking points, both from the show... And from little vignettes on the show as well. So we are going to dive into everything NXT TakeOver War Games related. First things first, I actually want to make mention. I want to make mention of a huge milestone that we actually reached over the weekend. I do want to send out a special thank you to everyone who has ever gone out of your way to watch the DJ Storms brand. Who has gone out of your way to watch a video of mine, uh, comment on a video of mine, like even the people that dislike and hate watch me. I know you're swinging from my pubic hair just waiting on every single word that comes out of my mouth. You just love, you love to rage over this devilish like smile. That is on my face every single time I press record. You just love to watch me. You love me so much. You love to hate me. I'm the highlight of your days, even though you can't stand me. Go show you how pathetic your lives really are. Regardless of that, we hit a huge milestone over the weekend. So I'd like to thank every single person who has ever gone out of your way to watch my videos. Because we recently accumulated 50,000 plus views from all the videos that I've ever uploaded over the course of my three plus year tenure here on YouTube, 50,000 plus views accumulated over the weekend. I would like to thank each and every single one of you for tuning into every single one of my videos, whether you're new, whether you're a OG, whether you're a hater, whether you're a lover, no matter who you are, no matter who you are, I greatly appreciate every single one of you who has ever watched my videos. You guys made that possible. Without you, there would be no DJ Storms. The DJ Storms brand really just started off because I was just bored. I was just bored, and it became an absolute phenomenon, no matter what anyone wants to tell you. People are watching, people are listening, and people cannot get enough of DJ Storms. But from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for going out of your way to watch my videos, comment, like, do whatever you do whenever you watch my videos, whether you watch them, whether you're at home, whether you watch them on your way to work, whether you watch them at work, whether you watch them coming home from work, whether you watch them on vacation, whether you watch them on staycation. No matter where you watch, no matter where you listen, no matter how you get your intake of DJ Storms, thank you very much. You guys made it possible. Another thing I would like to say thank you for is the performance on the rundown for NXT TakeOver War Games 2020 with Matt Moody. We actually overperformed, considering that the NXT product really is not all that exciting. There's no buzz, there's no love around the current NXT product, especially recently with all of the counter-programming ideas that they're doing for All Elite Wrestling and all of the... All of the week-to-week -week booking decisions and all of the main roster-like material that they're injecting into NXT. There hasn't really been much buzz, much love around NXT, but the rundown for NXT TakeOver War Games actually outdid the rundown for NXT TakeOver 31 with Matt Moody. Matt Moody outperformed himself. 
The rundown for TakeOver 31 only has about 112, 113 views, but within two days, within two days, the rundown for NXT TakeOver War Games actually accumulated over 130 views. So we outperformed our last collaboration tenfold. So I actually want to thank you guys for that. You guys did an awesome, awesome, awesome job going out of your way to share that stream out and to watch that stream. You guys are absolute beasts. Thank you very much. I greatly appreciate it. First things first, before we get into everything, follow me on the Twitter sticks. Of course, Danielle loves that line. The Twitter sticks at HistoryMakerDJS. You'll find out why I am the operator of the best damn Twitter ever known to mankind. I mean, everybody, everybody wants to know what I'm going to say. So follow me on Twitter. Follow me on Instagram and Periscope at VDJStorms. Add me on Facebook as well. For collaborations and business inquiries, please send me an email. My email is stormstakeover at gmail.com. I need you guys to like the official DJ Storms business page as well. And if you do, I made you send you a friend request. And then I will send you an invite to join the official DJ Storms posse group on Facebook. We are actually two members away from 100 members. The DJ Storms posse group on Facebook. That is only for the elite, the elite members of the DJ Storms Posse. If you want to join, you're going to have to like the page, send me a friend request, and then I may just send you an invite. Who's going to be the lucky two members that help us reach 100 members? It could be you. It could be you. Check out all those links. All those links that I just named are in the description. If you want to check out my social medias, the DJ Storms business page, the DJ Storms Posse group chat, and of course my email, all the links are in the description. Also, one link that is in the description is, of course... The lightning flash update link from two days ago in which I streamed just four minutes shy of three hours, just four minutes shy of three hours in which we dissected a lot of material. We dissected, of course, six weekly shows. We dissected a great AEW Winter Is Coming show. We dissected the Go Home show for NXT TakeOver War Games. We dissected a great episode of NXT UK and the great material that they've been putting out. They've actually felt more like NXT than NXT has felt like NXT. Of course, I ripped Monday Night Raw a new asshole. And of course, we touched upon the... SmackDown show from two days ago, or three days ago, rather. We touched upon the SmackDown show from three days ago and the great Kevin Owens, Roman Reigns storyline that is brewing. Jay Uso also has major plans in store for him. We discussed that. We discussed WWE possibly giving an update on whether fans are allowed back at the Royal Rumble on January 7th. They're reportedly waiting for an answer from the state of Florida on... January 7th. Right now, it's 50-50. Things are up in the air. I also did a heated rant on Bruce Pritchard and how many superstars are actually frustrated with Bruce Pritchard and how WrestlingNews.co is stating that, oh, you can't find time for everyone, which is complete bullshit. If you're the CEO of a company or if you're the executive director of a company and you can't find something of value for every single one of your employees to do, then why the fuck are you even employed? Why are you even in a position of power if you can't find a vital role for every single one of your employees? If I'm the CEO of a company, if I'm the executive director of any company, it's not just a wrestling company, I should be able to find a spot of value for every single one of my employees that I have at my disposal. Simple as that. So I ranted on that report of a lot of superstars being frustrated with Bruce Prichard, which again, it does not take a rocket scientist. There's no way that you can watch Raw and SmackDown and tell me, oh yeah, I don't understand why superstars are frustrated with Bruce Prichard. There's no way that a superstar could be frustrated with Bruce Prichard. And if you do think that, then you are mentally fucked up in the head. So I'm just pointing that out there. But that link is in the description. Please go check that out if you missed it. We are almost 10 minutes into the video, and if you haven't liked the video, I don't know what the fuck you're doing. I mean, come on. We are 10 minutes into the video. If you haven't liked the video, then like the fucking video. I mean, I'm trying to get into the eyes of many, many, many other people, but in order to do that, my videos need to gain likes and views. So first things first, I need you to hit the thumbs up on the video. It's right down there. So all you need to do is hit it. It's not that hard. Now, when you hit that thumbs up, after you hit that thumbs up, I need you guys to share out the stream. 
And I'm not talking about just on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook or Tumblr or Pinterest. I'm talking about all platforms of social media. Whatever social media that you have at your disposal, I need you to share the goddamn stream out. We're trying to get as many people in here as possible. But in order to do that, you guys are going to have to do your part. I'm doing my part. I mean, I'm the greatest fucking thing since sliced bread. So I need you guys to share out the stream wherever. Whether it be YouTube or Pinterest or Tumblr, wherever. Come on. Just share it out. And when you share out the stream, please keep the chat alive. Keep the chat alive. Interact amongst yourselves. Interact with me. Tell me what your favorite match was at War Games. Tell me what you think of War Games. Tell me what you rate this war games on a scale from 1 to 10. Tell me what you rate this war games as far as the best takeover of the year goes. Personally, for me, I'm just giving you my short thoughts here before I go into a full dissection of the show. I would put it as the second best takeover of the year, personally, for me. But I want to hear your guys' thoughts on it. Please tell me what you thought of takeover war games and where you would rank it on the list of best takeovers of 2020. Keep the chat alive, and when you keep the chat alive, you gotta make sure you are subscribed. Hit the subscribe button. YouTube is run by a bunch of fucking dickheads because I am subjected to subscriber purgeons. If you know what that means, you know what that means. I'll tell you what it means, even though I'm not here to educate you. Well, actually, I am actually am here to educate you. But regardless, I'm not a college professor. Regardless of that, YouTube purgence means YouTube is taking away my subscribers for whatever fucking reason. YouTube has really become a glorified children's fucking app, which sucks. But regardless, I'm still here. I'm not fucking migrating to Twitch. I've spent too long building up a fucking brand over here. And I ain't going anywhere, no matter how many subscribers YouTube wants to purge me of. So please, please. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't already subscribed to the channel. Become a member of the DJ Storm's posse. As Pat McAfee says, do it for the brand. Do it for the brand. And when you hit that subscribe button, you gotta make sure you hit that notifications bell with a huge coup de gras. That way, you will know whenever I pop up on YouTube. Because whenever I pop up on YouTube, it is the best time to be on YouTube. It's the only time you gonna get to see this glorious sideburn chin strap combination. And this beautiful mustache right here. Is there even a question if I have? Of course I have it. What did you think this is? You think I'm an amateur? You think I'm gonna forget? Come on. Just gotta touch it just a little bit. Just a little bit. You know why? Because everybody wants a piece of the Storm's Meister. <laughs> Actually, you know what? Just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. Just a little bit more because I'm an arrogant douchebag. Just a little bit more because I'm an arrogant douchebag. There you go. <laughs> Anyway, enough of the self-brand promotion and the advertisements. We're going to get straight into the rewind here. So, NXT TakeOver War Games 4. We started off with the women's War Games match. It was Team Candice versus Team Shotzi. Team Candice LeRae, of course, consisted of Candice LeRae, Raquel Gonzalez, Dakota Kai, and Tony Storm. They took on Team Shotzi, which consisted of Shotzi Blackheart, Rhea Ripley, Ember Moon, and the NXT Women's Champion, Io Shirai. This was the second ever Women's War Games match. And I gotta be quite honest with you. I did not expect this match to outperform last year's Women's War Games match. But I would say that this match actually outperformed last year's Women's War Games match. And... It was very, very hard to do so considering last year's Women's War Games match had such a great story. such so, so many moving parts, so many moving elements in that match that made that match so great. I mean, the wrestling was great as well, but there was just such a better build to that match. The build for this takeover specifically, this takeover specifically overall, the build was just so fucking piss poor. The build was so piss poor, and I don't even believe that I'm saying that. Usually the builds towards takeovers are usually the best builds towards any pay-per-view in the entire wrestling world, in the entire wrestling industry. The NXT takeover builds are usually the best built, best built weekly shows, best built takeovers. But this takeover and the last takeover, the builds have just been non-existent. And I really was not expecting this match to outperform last year's Women's War Games match, but 
The women absolutely brought everything in this. This was an awesome, awesome fucking War Games match right here. So, everyone made their entrance, but the one entrance that stuck out the most was Shotzi Blackheart's entrance. She actually rebuilt a new and improved tank. Had like a skull on the front of it. We had TCB. I don't know what that stood for. I don't know what that stood for, but... It was a huge new and improved tank that actually fired, that actually fired missiles, actually fired pyrotechnics. And I was watching this and I'm thinking to myself, wow, Shotzi Blackheart, she looks like a fucking superstar. And even though her team didn't win, I was expecting them to win, but they didn't. We'll talk about that later on. Even though she didn't win, she looked like an absolute badass. I'm telling you, if there is one woman that I see that is going to have a breakout year in 2021, it's her. She has really come a long way in the ring. Her entrance was badass. The presentation of Shotzi Blackheart was badass. And Triple H, I hear, really loves Shotzi Blackheart. So Shotzi Blackheart, she could be in for a big, big 2021. Keep your eye on Shotzi Blackheart. So she looked like a badass. We had Ember Moon and Dakota Kai starting off the match for their respective teams. They had a nice back and forth. Moon actually sandwiched Dakota Kai against the case with a running body block. Shotzi then entered as her team got the advantage for War Games on Wednesday. So she unloaded on Dakota Kai. We had Moon and Shotzi doing an electric chair dropkick combination on Dakota Kai before Raquel Gonzalez entered the match. She actually looked pretty good here. She was tossing around Moon and Shotzi like they were fucking ragdolls. We then had... We then had Raquel putting Kai on her shoulders and she used her like a weapon. You know how like some people put a ladder on their, on their heads and they swing the ladder around at their opponents? Raquel did that with Dakota Kai and she swung Dakota Kai's feet into the heads of Ember Moon and Shotzi Blackheart. I thought that was pretty cool. We had... Rhea Ripley coming in, coming in next. We actually had a little showdown between Rhea Ripley and Raquel Gonzalez. A little throwback from Halloween Havoc. Ripley then neutralized Dakota Kai. Ripley pulled out a hammer from a toolbox, which was actually brought in by Shotzi Blackheart. She pulled out one of those big mallet hammers. She used it against Dakota Kai. We had Rhea Ripley and Raquel Gonzalez going at it before Tony Storm entered the fray. She actually brought in some kendo sticks, and she started to expose the turnbuckles. The pads were coming off. Rhea Ripley was sent spine first into the turnbuckle. We then had two Tower of Doom superplexes, and all six women were down. Io Shirai then came in. She was attempting to bring in a ladder. She brought in two ladders, actually, but Raquel Gonzalez actually prevented Io Shirai from entering the War Games match. She kept on shoving her out every single time she tried to get in. So Shirai, Shirai brought in some chairs before Storm and Raquel Gonzalez actually blocked the door. Storm actually took her, took her ring belt off from her ring gear and she locked the cage door with her ring belt. So the heels actually fighting smart here, or so they thought they were fighting smart. We then had Candice LeRae entering, and Indy Hartwell came out and attacked Io Shirai. They brought in a trash can and a chair. Indy Hartwell then chained the door shut, and she took the key. LeRae had the advantage. Blackheart got whipped with multiple kendo sticks. And the ref was like, look, I can't start the War Games match until Shirai enters the cage. And Candice is like, count, count, count. There ain't no one coming in. I can't start the match unless... All competitors are in the ring. So the heels kind of look like dumbasses there. The heels kind of look like dumbasses there for the moment. We then had a big brawl, a big brawl of all of the women. Io Shirai climbed up to the top of the cage on the other side. We didn't see her climb up. Like a fucking maniac, Io Shirai, she, she has this crazy fucking look on her. She puts a trash can over her head and like a fucking... Like a fucking lunatic, she jumps off the cage with the trash can on her head. I actually thought she was going to do a moonsault with the fucking trash can. But she jumped off the cage with the trash can on top of her head, taking out the pile. Io Shirai, and 
I don't know if it was for an LOL moment. I don't really know what they were going for right there. I thought it was funny, but ultimately Io Shirai kind of looked a little dumb there. Still, still a fun spot. So War Games officially began. Team Shotzi went right after Team Loray. We had a moonsault, an over-the-moon salt on Raquel Gonzalez before Team Loray actually saved the match. Loray then used a wrench to stop Shotzi from making Storm tap out. Blackheart then used a kendo stick on Storm and Loray. Io came in, but she caught a boot from Dakota Kai. D Dakota Kai then put Io Shirai back in the trash can, and she delivered a coup de gras to Io Shirai while she was in the trash can. The trash can fucking shattered. That must have sucked for Shirai, because if Dakota Kai landed, landed wrong, she could have absolutely fucking crushed Io Shirai's jaw. So that was actually a crazy looking spot. I've never seen a coup de gras on the trash can before. She tried for the cover, but Ember Moon saved the match. This was actually a crazy-ass spot right here that could have absolutely put Dakota Kai out of commission if they fucked up. Ember Moon set up sh some chairs, like she was playing musical chairs, right? She went up to the top rope. She did a fucking eclipse, which dropped Dakota Kai jaw and neck first onto the chairs set up, and I swear to God, if that was not done right, if that was not done right, Dakota Kai could have been injured badly. So I am glad that they actually did that spot correctly. That that spot looked fucking brutal. I would not want to take a fucking spot like that. That was a great looking spot right there. So Storm then broke up the pinfall. She delivered a Storm Zero to Ember Moon on the trash can. Before Shirai saved it, Shirai and Ripley then set up a ladder between the steel plate that held the two rings together. Loray, Loray then used the trash can against Rhea Ripley and Io Shirai. We had Blackheart dropping Candice. They started climbing the ladder, and Blackheart actually dropped Candice off the ladder onto some steel chairs. Candice used the steel chair to blocked some of the impact from Shotzi Blackheart's senton. She delivered a senton off the apron, onto the chair, onto Candice. I thought that she was going to get the cover and win the match. We then had a moonsault by Io Shirai to Dakota Kai before Storm saved it. And Storm neutralized Rhea Ripley. Raquel Gonzalez... Raquel Gonzalez then powerbombed Io Shirai off of the top rope through the ladder, through the steel plate, through the ladder onto the steel plate between the rings, and Raquel Gonzalez covered Io Shirai, and she won the match for her team. I would be, I would be a pretty shitty person, which I'm not. I would be a pretty shitty person if I was not to give credit to my friend Joseph Conlon. Shout out to him if he's watching. Joseph Conlon actually stated this on his preview and prediction show for NXT TakeOver War Games 2020. He actually stated that the women have actually been the best thing about NXT for months now. And I absolutely agree with that. I cannot argue that whatsoever. In a time in which NXT has really deteriorated and Vince McMahon has just completely stripped NXT of everything that it once was. In a time of in a time of in a time of darkness for NXT, the women have really been the one thing that has kept NXT afloat. The women have been booked so consistently. You take a look at what the women have done ever since the start of this pandemic era with NXT. The women had the best match of the night at NXT Takeover in your house. The women the women's match at Takeover 30 between Dakota Kai and Io Shirai was actually better than the main event. We had Candice LeRae and Io Shirai putting on two great women's matches throughout the month of October. Io Shirai and Rhea Ripley put on a takeover-worthy women's championship match away for free on television. I'm actually still wondering why that wasn't on this show. I'm wondering why that wasn't on this show. The women have really been the shining stars of the pandemic era of NXT. The women's division in NXT is fucking awesome. And this War Games match was fucking excellent. Now, I was expecting Team Shotzi to win. I was not expecting Team Candice to win. 
I thought that they were going to build up Shotzi Blackheart, and this was really going to be a breakout performance for Shotzi, which it kind of was. She looked good here. She looked decent here and there. She wasn't pinned, so obviously Triple H protected her. But the main story of this match was the fact that they built up Raquel Gonzalez. And I have really been hard on Raquel Gonzalez. I have completely shit all over Raquel Gonzalez. I actually once called her the female Braun Strowman. She had absolutely no appeal to her. Matter of fact, a lot of people thought that she was fucking Sonya Deville when she first showed up at NXT TakeOver Portland almost a year ago when she aligned herself with Dakota Kai initially. And she did not. She did not add any value to the show whatsoever. She was actually taking credibility away from Dakota Kai at first. But over the course of the last two months, I really have to admit, Raquel Gonzalez is actually, has actually morphed into a fairly decent hand in the women's division. I am not even bullshitting you. I was shitting all over Raquel Gonzalez initially, rightfully so, because she was extremely green. She was extremely basic. She did not add anything of value. She was very, very stiff and... Very uncoordinated in the ring at first. She really, she really did remind me of Braun Strowman. I'm like, this woman is the Braun Strowman of the women's division. She is nothing but a tall woman who looks good. Braun Strowman is nothing but a tall individual that has an intimidating look. Same with Raquel Gonzalez. Raquel Gonzalez actually proved me wrong. I'm not even lying. If Raquel Gonzalez can keep up the momentum that she has been on right now, the monumental streak that she's been on right now, I think I may be, I may be becoming a Raquel Gonzalez fan. I am not even bullshitting you. Raquel Gonzalez actually put on a damn good match with Rhea Ripley at NXT Halloween Havoc, and she actually had a great performance here in War Games. Now, Io Shirai taking the pinfall, I absolutely fucking hate that. I absolutely fucking hate that. That should not have happened. If you wanted to have someone take the pinfall, you should have had Rhea Ripley take the pinfall. Because no matter how good Rhea Ripley's been, no matter how excellent that match was with Io Shirai on NXT television, Rhea Ripley is just a dead fucking character in the women's division. No matter how great she is, especially after what happened at NXT TakeOver in your house, after she lost the NXT Women's Championship to Charlotte, and then she was pinned by Io Shirai in that triple threat match. Charlotte didn't even take the fucking pinfall, which I don't know why. But if you were going to have someone take the pinfall here, you should have had Rhea Ripley take the pinfall from Raquel Gonzalez. There's no reason to have a champion lose. No matter if Io Shirai was somewhat protected in a way, she took a fucking, she took a fucking powerbomb off the top rope, threw a ladder onto the steel plate. So obviously, obviously no one's fucking kicking out of that. No one's fucking kicking out of that, but you really couldn't have had anybody else take the pinfall there. I really don't understand. I really don't understand anyone's obsessions with having champions lose for free on television. No champion should be losing non-title matches, even in a match like that, even in a fucking war games match like that. I was even a little mad. I was even a little mad when Shayna Baszler was the one pinned by Rhea Ripley last year at war games. So they pretty much did the same thing that they did with Rhea and Shayna with Raquel and Io here. And it looks like Raquel Gonzalez could be the next challenger for Io Shirai, which I won't mind. I won't mind. I'd actually like to see what Raquel Gonzalez can do against someone like Io Shirai. And if anyone can bring Raquel Gonzalez to her best match in NXT to date, I do believe it is Io Shirai. She had a damn good match with Rhea Ripley. She had a great performance here at War Games. So I would actually like to see... More of Raquel Gonzalez. I would actually like to see Raquel Gonzalez continue to improve and continue doing shit like this. And if she does, then I think that Raquel Gonzalez could also have a very good 2021. The NXT Women's Division right now, they are doing some great fucking things. I fucking hate that Io Shirai took the pin. She should have never taken the pin. Again, if you were going to have someone lose this match, if you were going to have Candice LeRae's team win this match, then Rhea Ripley should have taken the pinfall. You weren't going to pin Ember Moon because she just came back. You weren't going to pin Shotzi because Shotzi is going to be a priority in 2021. And you shouldn't have pinned Io because she is the NXT Women's Champion. You could have gotten Raquel Gonzalez into an NXT Women's Championship match by having her pin Rhea Ripley. She fucking won war games. What more do you need to do? You don't need to pin the champion. It's such a lame fucking concept. It's such an outdated fucking concept. Oh, 
beat the champion, and you get a title shot. It's, a, it's such a lame, outdated concept. So I fucking hated that. In no way, shape, or form should Io Shirai have taken a pinfall loss. But, but, despite that, Raquel Gonzalez had a breakout performance here. I am actually very impressed with what Raquel Gonzalez has been doing. And if she keeps this up, I think I may just become a fan of her. She's actually doing some pretty decent work. If she can continue this momentum, then I would have a problem with seeing Raquel Gonzalez on television. She started out like shit, and she proved me wrong. She proved me wrong. That's what I want to see. I would like to see progression. I would like to see improvement. And Raquel Gonzalez has actually improved. I have no problem with Raquel Gonzalez right now. And if she continues this momentum to 2021, she could be a very solid hand in the division. I was expecting Team Shotzi to win, considering that Shotzi black card is a big priority. But they wanted to push Raquel Gonzalez and give Raquel Gonzalez a breakout moment. So Team Candice LeRae wins this match. Awesome War Games match. And if anything, this was the best match of the night. Overall, the women absolutely brought everything they had to the table. This was an awesome, awesome fucking War Games match. Shotzi Blackheart's definitely going to be a superstar in 2021. Team Candice gets the victory. Raquel Gonzalez is coming along very nicely, I will admit. We had a little vignette. A little vignette for Finn Balor. And Finn Balor said, enjoy your war games, enjoy the cages, enjoy the spectacle, because this Wednesday, all eyes go back on the prince. So Finn Balor will be returning to NXT television this Wednesday night, and I do believe that we will see the start of the build towards Finn Balor's next NXT championship title defense. And if I'm going to be quite honest with you, I am not liking where Finn Balor's NXT title reign is heading, especially considering the vignette that we got later on in the night, which we will talk about. But Finn Balor is returning to NXT. I do believe that his broken jaw is completely healed. I believe it takes about six to eight weeks, and I believe that his jaw is fully healed now. He should be getting back into action really soon, which I am very happy about, and I am very happy that he's not relinquishing the NXT championship. We then had Tommaso Ciampa versus Timothy Thatcher. This match came about because Ciampa said he wanted to fight Timothy Thatcher, and Ciampa interrupted a session of Thatch as Thatch Ken on Wednesday, and then Timothy Thatcher actually choked out Tommaso Ciampa. Now, this was good. It was good. It was hard-hitting. It was physical. I like that. Tommaso Ciampa did a fairly admirable job at bringing Timothy Thatcher to a semi-decent match. So, I didn't necessarily mind this match. I didn't necessarily mind this match, but if I'm going to be quite honest with you, this was probably the weakest match out of any match on the TakeOver card. It was still a good, good, not great, good match. But the beginning portions of this match were just fucking boring. Timothy Thatcher... Let me tell you something. Timothy Thatcher, he, he did more. He did more than fucking submission holds in this match, which I can appreciate, but Timothy Thatcher is still boring as shit. The majority of his offense is fucking submission holds, number one, and he just does not have any fucking appeal. He really doesn't. I'm sorry. He does not have anything that really makes you watch him. He's just a great wrestler that puts on decent matches when paired with the right opponents. He does not have a ceiling very, 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 very high. His ceiling is NXT. That's, that's it. His peak is NXT. If this guy gets called up to the main roster, he is not going... Well, well no, one, no one that gets called up to the main roster is having any semblance of success. You'd have to be lucky as fuck to have any semblance of success when you reach Raw or SmackDown. But regardless of that, Timothy Thatcher would absolutely fall flat on his fucking face on the main roster. But Timothy Thatcher is pretty much nothing more than a guy who's going to have some great performances here and there. And he's pretty much a glorified enhancement talent. He's pretty much the Baron Corbin of NXT. Now, he's leagues ahead of Baron Corbin. He's leagues better than fucking Baron Corbin. But 
The dude just has no fucking appeal. He has nothing that excites you. He's just a boring, bland person who's a great wrestler. That's it. That's pretty much it. Now, I'm not saying that this match was bad. This match was a very physical matchup. Brian Alvarez actually said that this was a great professional wrestling matchup. So, if you like good old-fashioned pro wrestling, this was a great matchup in many people's eyes. But, in reality, it was just a good match that was a nice bridge into the strap match between Cameron Grimes and Dexter Loomis. It was a decent little match right here. Champa. Champa did his job, the match did his job, and that's pretty much all we can ask for. Decent little 13-minute match right here. We had Champa manipulating the joints of Thatcher early on before Thatcher gained the advantage. He used his aggression against Champa. He actually need and elbowed Champa's upper body. Champa actually tried to mount the comeback before they collided heads, and Champa actually got a little bruise. He got a little bruise right right above his his left eye i believe it was it was lightly bleeding it wasn't like pouring blood it was just lightly bleeding we then had champa mounting a comeback he hit clothesline after clothesline after clothesline after clothesline big flying forearm connected champa with a big superplex from the top rope that only got a two count champa then locked in a guillotine or champa then got locked in a guillotine but he pushed thatcher and himself to the floor he then came back with two jumping knees that actually busted Thatcher's ear open. And Thatcher was actually bleeding from his ear. That actually was a very nice sight to see. It made Thatcher look like a badass. Not even fucking lying to you. Champa, then with the bulldog choke and Thatcher's ear continued to drip blood. Thatcher was able to fight out of it. He hit two German suplexes and then he got choked out on the ropes he got choked out on the ropes but he was able to fight back thatcher then got tied up in the ropes he got chopped one chopped two chopped three he kept chopping them and chopping them and chopping them over and over again then champa actually locked in his own guillotine on the ropes but before the five count before the five count was completed champa hit willow's bell and champa won Champa pinned Thatcher's shoulders to the mat, and Champa won the match. Hard hitting, physical. It went the proper amount of time, and it was certainly not the best match. Certainly not the best match that you'll see. Again, the beginning portions of this match were actually very boring, very slow. Typical Timothy Thatcher paced match, but by the end of it, it actually turned out to be a fairly decent hard hitting and physical matchup. And by the end of it, Champa got the win, as he should. And if I am to be honest with you, I I really saw this match as nothing more than a a bridge match, if I'm going to be quite honest, because Champa he's just coming off a win against Velveteen Dream. So I feel as though this was nothing more than a bridge match to get Champa on a takeover, get him a win over Timothy Thatcher, Thus resulting in Champa challenging Finn Balor for the NXT title before the end of the month. I do believe that NXT is probably setting up a big, big show. Matter of fact, matter of fact, if anything, if anything, I could actually see Champa versus Balor on the first NXT of the new year, which we'll talk about. They actually announced that as a special event, quote unquote. So, I would actually not mind seeing Champa versus Balor on the first NXT of the new year. And Balor can go over there. Champa will help put Finn Balor over. Simply because right now, if we're going to be quite honest with you, right now, right now, Champa, Champa's in a position where he is bulletproof and he's really in a position where he's putting people over you take a look at what champ has done this year he put over adam cole at takeover portland he put over carrying cross at takeover in your house he put over kushida and now he would put over finn balor champa right now he's not going anywhere champa is not going up to the main roster he even said he would retire if he goes up to the main roster so champa he's remaining in nxt for the foreseeable future 
if anything, if anything, Champa, Champa could very well be the NXT champion by the end of 2021. Right now, Champa doesn't need to be the NXT champion. Champa's already a made man. So if anything, Champa should be used to enhance others. And right now, Balor is the one that needs an enhancement, considering that he has not been in action since October, and he caught a broken jaw in his match with Kyle O'Reilly. So Finn Balor needs something to help enhance his NXT Championship reign. And if anything, I would actually love to see a match between Champa and Balor. And that's exactly what I can see happening here. I would love to see Champa versus Finn Balor for the NXT Championship with Balor going over, but... Decent match right here between Champa and Thatcher. Thatcher really is not going anywhere. He is a hard-hitting and physical wrestler, but the guy has the charisma of a fucking doorknob. So, from there we go into Dexter Loomis versus Cameron Grimes, or as he says it, <clears throat> it is uh, Dexter Loomis versus Cameron Grimes. In a strap match, and when you're strapped up to Cameron Grimes, oh man, oh man, you gonna be scared. And then after tonight, Cameron Grimes is going to the moon. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know a lot of people probably want to reach through the screen and hit me senseless. So, Dexter Loomis and Cameron Grimes, this was a strap match. And I have been very hard on the feud. The feud in itself made no sense to continue. I really don't understand why they continued this feud all the way into TakeOver. If anything, it should have ended after the Haunted House of Terrors match. It really seemed like they just put this feud together because they legitimately had nothing else to do for these two guys. And that, that, really, that really pisses me off. I don't really know why. I really don't know why they just oversaturated this feud with gimmick after gimmick after gimmick with a blindfold match, um, the burlap sack, sack, and then we had the Haunted House of Terrors match, which was great. That was probably the best thing about the feud. I don't know why they oversaturated the feud with so much gimmicky bullshit, but by the end of this match, this was actually a very... Very fun strap match. Um, Cameron Grimes and Dexter Loomis, they actually did a very, very, very good job. It really did play into Dexter Loomis' strength. Cameron Grimes looked great here. We had Grimes actually coming out with a strap. And he says, no, 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 this strap or no strap at all. So we had Grimes attacking Loomis before the match even began. He was sending... He was sending him into the barricade before Loomis was able to fight back. The match officially began when Loomis put the strap on his wrist. So Loomis and Grimes, they fought to the outside. Grimes got tossed into the barricade. He actually got tossed into the barricade really, really, really fucking hard. He got tossed into the barricade, and the barricade actually fucking shifted. Grimes, I'm not sure if he threw himself into the barricade or Dexter Loomis really just threw Grimes incredibly hard into, a, into the barricade, but... The barricade shifted. The barricade actually fucking shifted. So, Grimes, I can imagine his back is going to be killing him today. So the barricade shifted. Grimes then back suplexed Loomis over the barricade. He back suplexed Loomis over the barricade. Loomis was in the air and then he was gone. It's like he just sunk into the abyss. So, we then had Grimes trying to recollect himself. And Loomis, like a fucking horror movie character put his hands up on the barricade, and then he peered his head over the barricade with those big-ass eyes. I thought that was hilarious there. Grimes used the strap to his advantage and pulled Loomis over the barricade. Loomis landed hard. Then we had Grimes, and this is actually, this is actually a smart move on the part of Cameron Grimes. Grimes took the original sack, that the referee had, where he had another strap, and Grimes put the sack over Loomis's head to cover his eyes, and he started whipping Loomis with the other strap. So Cameron Grimes being very scrappy there. We then had Loomis mounting a comeback. Loomis then tried to 
tried to grab Cameron Grimes, put him in the silence, but Grimes ended up suplexing him into the turnbuckle. Grimes then pulled out a steel chair, which was legal because it's no disqualification. He used that against Loomis. Loomis then pulled the strap and caught him in a fallaway slam. Loomis then got pulled off the top by Cameron Grimes as Loomis went for a diving clothesline off the top, but he ended up getting pulled by the strap, and Cameron Grimes sent Loomis to the floor. Cameron Grimes with a Spanish fly for a two. Cameron Grimes has a beautiful Spanish fly. I love the Spanish fly that Cameron Grimes does, and the one thing that I love about it is the fact that the fact that he can do it to anyone. I absolutely love Cameron Grimes is Spanish fly because he can do it to absolutely anyone. He's done it to Loomis. He's done it to Keith Lee. He's done it to Johnny Gargano. He's done it to Dijakovic. Cameron Grimes has a beautiful connection on his Spanish fly. And it's not, it's not something that gets talked about very often. Cameron Grimes does a beautiful Spanish fly. So he pulled Dexter Loomis into a Spanish fly. That got a two. Loomis then got crafty, and he actually tied up Cameron Grimes' legs in the strap. He pulled the strap. Cameron Grimes slipped, went headfirst into a chair that was set up in the ring. And then Loomis tried to lock in the silence. Cameron Grimes tried to reach for the strap to take, to take his hand out from the strap. And Cameron Grimes was on the receiving end of Loomis wrapping the strap around his eyes. Locking in the silence, and Cameron Grimes was forced to tap out. Dexter Loomis wins the strap match. This was a very, very fun match. I was not expecting it to be this fun, but this was actually a much better strap match than the strap match we saw with Roderick Strong and Dexter Loomis. Cameron Grimes and Dexter Loomis delivered a very, very, very fun strap match. Dexter Loomis, let me tell you something about Dexter Loomis. Dexter Loomis... It takes a lot. It takes a lot to put in the dedication to a character like Dexter Loomis to keep a stern face and not scream and not not show any emotion. It really takes a lot to put forth. It really takes a lot to put forth a character like that. And that's something that Loomis, Loomis has absolutely perfected. Loomis does not get enough appreciation. And he's a very good wrestler too. The guy's a very, very, very good wrestler, too. The guy can fucking wrestle, and the guy knows how to play a serious, stern character. He does not break. Nothing can fucking break Loomis. It's easy, Like I said on the rundown, it's easy for MJF to play a, a prick. All you need to do is be an asshole to people, and everyone can be an asshole. It's much, it's much easier. Like, pretty much everyone in 2020 is a fucking asshole, if we're going to be quite honest here. But... A guy like Dexter Loomis, to play a character like that and play it so perfectly, especially with a guy like Cameron Grimes. If I'm if I'm if I'm Dexter Loomis, if I was in Dexter Loomis' position, I would be fucking laughing my ass off every time Cameron Grimes ran away ran away screaming. Cameron Grimes, he's fucking hilarious in his own right. I'm surprised Dexter Loomis did not break character with Cameron Grimes. Dexter Loomis, I'm very 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 pleased, very happy that Dexter Loomis got a big spot on a takeover and he got a big win on a takeover, and I would love to hope, I would fucking love to hope that Dexter Loomis is going to be NXT North American Champion in 2021. If Dexter Loomis is not NXT North American Champion in 2021, they are absolutely doing something wrong in NXT. Dexter Loomis has all the makings to be an absolute breakout star. I actually thought that Dexter Loomis was going to win the NXT North American title at TakeOver 30 in that ladder match. And for all we know, he very well could have done that. For all we know, he very well could have done that if, if um, he didn't get injured. He was out for 10 weeks because of an ankle injury. If anything, he could have ended up being the NXT North American champion at TakeOver 30. But we'll never know that. Now he's in a... Good position right now where he's got a win on a big takeover. And now we can move forth. We can move forth into 2021. And I hope to God that Dexter Loomis will be NXT North American Champion by NXT TakeOver WrestleMania weekend. Dexter Loomis is great. He is excellent. Very, very, very fun strap match with Mr. Cameron Grimes. Cameron Grimes will be a star in due time. But right now, Dexter Loomis 
is a top priority in NXT. Leon Ruff versus Johnny Gargano versus Damian Priest. This was a triple threat match for the NXT North American Championship. I am not going to discredit anyone. I'm not going to discredit any of the three competitors in this match. I'm not. I'm not. The match itself was a great triple threat match. Matter of fact, it was probably the best match on the show that wasn't a War Games match. Not even going to lie. It was probably the best match on the show that wasn't a War Games match. But no matter how great this match was, and it was a great match, do not get me wrong, it was a great match, but the damage is already done, unfortunately. I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but the damage is already done, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Let's go over what happened in the match. We had Leon Ruff and Gargano actually working together to take out Priest momentarily. Ruff then got taken out by a slingshot spear by Gargano. Priest then was going back and forth with Leon Ruff. Leon Ruff slapped Priest. Priest just uncorked the right fucking forearm on Ruff. We then had Priest lifting up Ruff, and he hit a razor's edge that sent Leon Ruff through a propped-up barricade. Literally broke this fucker in half. Literally broke this little twig in half. And the refs actually had to carry Ruff out. So the refs were carrying Ruff out. Gargano then took advantage. He was one-on-one -on -one momentarily. Ruff then came back and he dove, he dove over the top rope with a plancha on Gargano. He started going to town on Gargano. Ruff, then he came back with a diving senton plancha, taking out both men on the outside. Ruff with a beautiful, a beautiful fucking springboard cutter out of the corner for a close two count. And then a rebound lariat for a two. See, here's the thing. And a lot of people... A lot of people want to want to twist the narrative and say, like, oh my god, you hate Leon Ruff. I don't hate Leon Ruff. Earl Cole thinks I hate Leon Ruff. My, my man Earl Cole thinks I hate Leon Ruff. I don't hate Leon Ruff. He's a damn good wrestler. I want to see a guy like Leon Ruff succeed. I want to see a guy like Leon Ruff be given these opportunities. Guy's a damn good wrestler. I hate how they have portrayed Leon Ruff. I hate what they did with Leon Ruff. I hate how they're fucking hot potatoing the North American Championship to Leon Ruff, to Gargano, to Damian Priest. I hate how they literally took this guy from nothing when he got broke kicked by Sheamus in 60 seconds. He tapped out to Karrion Cross in 60 seconds. He was literally embarrassed by Austin Theory, but yet we're supposed to take him seriously as a North American champion when this guy has no wins behind him. This guy has no momentum behind him. He was literally plucked from nothing. No character development, no build, and he was just given the fucking North American Championship. This ain't fucking Daniel Bryan versus The Authority at WrestleMania 30. This ain't Becky Lynch winning the Royal Rumble with a bad knee in 2019. Leon Ruff has done nothing. I don't hate Leon Ruff. He's a damn good wrestler. I just don't want to see him as a champion unless you properly build him up and present him like an actual fucking superstar, which they haven't. They presented him like a fucking joke. This is literally a recreation of what WWE did with James Ellsworth, AJ Styles, and John Moxley, aka Dean Ambrose, back on SmackDown in 2016. With, with Ellsworth being in the middle of a storyline between two world-class athletes that are leagues ahead of him. So, Ruff, with a rebound Larry on Gargano for a two, we then had a double-leaping flatliner by Damian Priest. Priest. Priest with a couple of splashes in the corner. We had a lawn dart to Ruff by Gargano into Priest. Gargano then tied up Priest in the ropes and Ruff tried for a crucifix bomb the same way, the same way that he beat, he beat Gargano for the North American Championship initially. We then had Gargano just barely kicking out. He then locked in the Gargano escape, and Priest was able to wriggle his way free from the ropes, and he was able to save the match. Ruff got super kicked by Gargano. Gargano then was caught with South of Heaven by Damian Priest before Ghostface showed up. At least six Ghostfaces showed up. 
They started swarming priests. Priests had to fight them off. We had a series of planchas wiping out the ghost faces. We then had a frog splash out of nowhere by Leon Ruff. Priest just barely saved the fucking match. We then had a discus tornado kick turning Ruff inside out. Ruff was taken out by another super kick by Gargano. We had a tornado kick by Priest. Then out of nowhere, we had another ghost face hitting Damian Priest with a lead pipe. We had Damian Priest getting taken out, a super kick to Ruff. One final beat, and Leon Ruff loses the North American title back to Gargano. Gargano becomes the first ever three-time North American champion in NXT history. Great match. Not even going to bullshit. Great match. Great match. Great match, but the damage has already been done. The damage has already been done because you wanted to create a shock and awe factor. You wanted to desperately try and create an unpredictability factor by giving Leon Ruff the North American title in hopes that people will see this unpredictability factor as, Oh my god, a championship match is on NXT. I need to watch if it changes hands. Which, obviously, it didn't work because NXT is still under 700,000 viewers. So, you're not, and I'm telling you right now, you ain't, you ain't gonna generate any unpredictability factor. You ain't gonna generate any buzz. You ain't gonna generate any excitement with decisions like that. You ain't. The damage has already been done. Why you even gave Leon Ruff the North American title, it is beyond me. Gargano should have never lost the title. Hell, if we're going to be quite honest here, Damian Priest should have never lost the title. There's no reason for Gargano to hold the North American title. Gargano is above the NXT North American title. Gargano should not be in a position to win the North American title because the North American title should be used to build up stars that aren't on the level of a Johnny Gargano or a Tommaso Ciampa or an Adam Cole or a Finn Balor. The NXT North American title should be their version of the Intercontinental title. It should be used for guys like Priest, for guys like Loomis, for Grimes, for Austin Theory, for Bronson Reed. Those guys. So, I don't know why you weren't positioning Johnny Gargano to face off against Finn Balor for the NXT Championship. I don't really get it. Now, afterwards, we had Austin Theory unmasking himself as one of the ghost faces. So I don't know who the fuck, who the fuck the other ghost faces are. Matter of fact, I'm still wondering why Gargano even needs all these hired guns in order to help him win matches. How many fucking people did Johnny Gargano have helping him win the matches over there? We're gonna get another fucking retribution faction? I don't understand what the fuck they're doing. Gargano has been a heel before. Gargano's been a heel before and he's won matches on his own as a heel. Why does he need all these hired guns now? I don't mind Austin Theory working with Gargano. I think it could be a great partnership, but at this rate, why is he even working with Gargano? Are we going to even get an explanation? Indy Hartwell has been working with the Garganos for two months now, and she still hasn't even given an explanation as to why she's working with the Garganos. Is Austin Theory just going to be there? I don't mind him working with Gargano, but you got to give me a fucking explanation on Wednesday. Indy Hartwell has been working with Candice and Johnny for two months, and she still hasn't given anyone a fucking explanation. Why? So I don't understand why you have all these hired guns helping Johnny Gargano. It reeks of main roster fucking garbage. It reeks of main roster garbage. No one wants to see main roster garbage on NXT. That's actually one of the things that has absolutely deteriorated the NXT product from what it once was. So I don't know why we have all these hired guns helping Johnny and helping Candice. I don't know. It, it makes absolutely no sense. It makes absolutely no sense. Gargano should have never lost the title to begin with. I don't understand why you are just padding Johnny Gargano's stats. There's no reason for Johnny Gargano to constantly win and lose titles and act like he's cursed. Leon Ruff should have never won the title. Now it's going to take months to rebuild the prestige of that title. Gargano should have never lost the title, and hell, if we're going to be quite honest, like I said, Damian Priest should have never lost the title. Damian Priest should still be the North American champion right now. I don't mind Austin Theory working with Johnny Gargano. I'd love to see what the explanation is. I just don't like the fact that Johnny Gargano needs all these fucking hired guns to win. Heels don't need to cheat to win. Heels don't need to cheat to win. Heels can win on their own just fine. 
We had a couple of vignettes before this match. I skipped over this. Before this match, we actually had a Vulture video package with a clock. And at the end of this little vignette, you heard TikTok. So, Karrion Cross looks to be on his way back to NXT. I would have bet my life that he was going to the main roster and he was possibly going to debut at the Royal Rumble. And if I'm going to be quite honest here, I don't like it. If I'm going to be quite honest here, Karrion Cross back in NXT actually does a lot more damage to NXT than it does help. WWE. They had a chance with Karrion Cross to get it right. They had a chance with Karrion Cross to get it right. Karrion Cross, he came into NXT and they pushed him to the NXT Championship within five months. More specifically, Vince McMahon pushed him to the NXT Championship within five months. Why? It's because Vince McMahon looked at him and Vince McMahon got an erection. Why? Because he's a six foot five, two hundred sixty pound muscle man. Vince McMahon pushes and signs people to contracts based on their looks. It has nothing to do with talent. And don't get me wrong, Karrion Cross is very talented. He's very talented. He's a great pro wrestler. He's a great pro wrestler. He has a great character. He's a great look. But Vince only looked at his look and his look alone. And he did not think ahead. Vince does not plan long term. Vince McMahon wants things now, 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 now. Vince McMahon is so impatient. Vince McMahon doesn't think about the future. Vince McMahon has a one-track mind. I want this person to be in this spot. I want that person to be in that spot based on his looks, based on whatever, and I want it ASAP. So what happened? Triple H had to put the NXT title on Keith Lee because Keith Lee was originally slated to go into NXT TakeOver 30 to face off against Damian Priest and drop the title to Damian Priest. Then Keith Lee would have been the NXT champion by TakeOver 31 against Adam Cole. Then we would have had Keith Lee get built up over the course of six months. Then he would have gone into WrestleMania TakeOver. Then Karrion Cross would have won the NXT title. Long-term build and long-term storytelling because outside of Karrion Cross's victory over Tommaso Ciampa, Karrion Cross really didn't do anything to earn himself an NXT Championship title opportunity. But Vince McMahon wanted Karrion Cross in that position. Vince McMahon was like, I want this guy in that position. And boom, he was put in that position. He was put in that position simply because of his looks and his looks alone. He's a great wrestler, he's a great character, but in no way, shape, or form did he deserve a fucking title match five months after his debut when all he got a victory over that had any meaning was the Tommaso Ciampa match at TakeOver In Your House. He got a victory over Tommaso Ciampa. That was the only victory that actually meant something. He was on a five, six, seven match winning streak. Seven matches and you're already worthy of an NXT title match? No! It should have been Finn Balor versus Adam Cole at TakeOver 30 for the NXT title. Cole should have retained. Then we would have gotten Cole versus Keith Lee at TakeOver 31. Keith Lee would have won. Then we would have gotten Keith Lee versus Karrion Cross at TakeOver WrestleMania weekend next year. Vince McMahon fast-tracked Karrion Cross to the NXT title eight months early because of his looks. Now that Karrion Cross was injured and he had to relinquish the title... Now the landscape of NXT is much different than it was four months ago. You have a lot more stars coming up through the rankings. WWE has not really built many stars with NXT this year, which is there's usually their specialty. That's Triple H's specialty. Triple H has created so many fucking stars, but they have not built up any new stars outside of Kushida. And Kushida is on like an 8-9 match winning streak. He's beaten a lot of people. He's beaten a lot of people of value. He's beaten Tony Nese. He's beaten Austin Theory. He's beaten Velveteen Dream. He's beaten Tommaso Ciampa. He's beaten Cameron Grimes. He's beaten Timothy Thatcher. He's beaten Arturo Artu Juaz. He's beaten everybody. Kushida's been winning and winning and winning for the last four months. You're not going to have that, that winning streak result in nothing. It's going to result in an eventual NXT title opportunity. And if that's the case, then Kushida has to win. You're really going to have all those wins result in him losing? So Karrion Cross now is coming back. That's bad news because now Karrion Cross is going to go forth against Finn Balor and he's going to get back the NXT title. And once Karrion Cross has the NXT title, 
Who is going to take the title off of him? Are you really going to put Tommaso Ciampa in there with Karrion Cross? Are you going to continue to build up Tommaso Ciampa for Karrion Cross? Are you going to have Ciampa get Goldie back at the hands of Karrion Cross? Now, I wouldn't mind that. That sounds like a great fucking story. But outside of Tommaso Ciampa, which wouldn't be a bad story, but realistically speaking, Ciampa's already a made guy. Ciampa's already a made guy. So what's going to happen to Kushida? Realistically, outside of Tommaso Ciampa, maybe you could possibly build up Ciampa to face off against Karrion Cross if Karrion Cross takes the NXT title back from Dollar. But outside of Ciampa, there's really no one that you can put against Karrion Cross that's going to be believable. There's no one that you can put against Karrion Cross that you can say, oh yeah, yeah, Karrion Cross is going to lose the title to that guy. You had something with, Dan with uh, Dominic Dijakovic, you had something with Keith Lee, unless you do Damian Priest, but I don't think Damian Priest is ready for the NXT title picture yet. He's a great wrestler, but he hasn't done anything. He hasn't done anything, and he had a two-month reign as North American champion. We could still be on the verge of getting another match between Damian Priest and Johnny Gargano, to which I'm going to say, all right, enough of this shit already. Enough of this shit. Karrion Cross coming back spells doom for everyone else. And not to be, not to be a, a jokester here, but it really does spell doom. Because at the end of the day, Karrion Cross is going to be placed in a position where he's going to win back the NXT title and no one's going to fucking beat the guy. You're going to have Karrion Cross run through all of these individuals. Hell, he could very well run through Tommaso Ciampa because even Tommaso Ciampa right now isn't believable enough to take down Karrion Cross. Not after what happened at... Take over in your house between Karrion Cross and Tommaso Ciampa and how Karrion Cross beat him in, inside of six fucking minutes. So, what are you going to do? Ultimately, what are you going to do? This spells doom because Karrion Cross is going to have a stranglehold on that title with zero believable challengers. You really think that Kushida is going to win that fucking title from Karrion Cross? No. Kushida should be the next in line for the NXT Championship. Karrion Cross going back to NXT puts a stranglehold on the NXT Championship to a point where no new stars are going to have the spotlight. And NXT is all about building up new stars. You're building up Dexter Loomis for the North American title. You're building up a potential Cameron Grimes for the NXT Championship. A potential Dexter Loomis for the NXT Championship. A potential Damian Priest for the NXT title. A potential Kushida for the NXT title. You're really going to throw that all out the window just so you can give Karrion Cross a legitimate NXT Championship reign? If Karrion Cross went up to the main roster, he'd have a lot more value because they need something else besides Roman Reigns on the main roster that's going to gravitate attention towards him. They need some, especially on Monday Night Raw. They got fucking nothing on Monday Night Raw. They need some on Monday Night Raw that's going to generate some interest. Karrion Cross would be a perfect person to slip into that role. I'd love to see Karrion Cross slip into a role where he could, he could fight other people, and he could be built up to potentially take the title off of Drew McIntyre. I'd love to see Drew McIntyre versus Karrion Cross. That sounds like a great fucking match. I don't understand why he needs to go back to NXT. You're pretty much putting a stranglehold on the NXT Championship that's not going to be broken anytime soon. It's going to take a lot to build up Tommaso Ciampa, considering what what Cross did to Tommaso Ciampa at TakeOver in your house. There's literally no one credible that's going to take that title off of Karrion Cross. should he win it back from Finn Balor, which more likely than not, he will. So you're really going to shaft Kushida? Unless you're going to give Kushida a shot at Johnny Gargano and have him win the NXT North American Championship. But if anything, this is the perfect opportunity for Kushida. I would strike now with Kushida. Strike when the iron's hot. Strike when you got a rising star. Strike when you have the right opportunity. And WWE has the right opportunity, but does WWE usually strike when they have the right opportunity? No. I don't like Karrion Cross coming back to NXT. That's going to do NXT a little bit more of a disservice. We also have New Year's Evil on January 6, 2021, the first NXT of the new year. New Year's Evil. Will it be a good show? Probably. But if I am to translate this for you, this is nothing more than counter-programming, counter-programming, counter-programming. We got to beat AEW in the ratings. We got to beat AEW in the ratings. Counter-programming, counter-programming. Keep AEW from reaching a million viewers. Counter-programming, counter-programming. 
Keep AEW from reaching a million viewers. Keep AEW from reaching a million viewers. Keep AEW from reaching a million viewers. This is the exact shit. This is the exact shit that has caused people to fall out of love with the NXT product. It absolutely sucks that NXT has become nothing more than a counter-programming device. It has become nothing more than a counter-programming show to take away from AEW's audience. The more that they focus on AEW and the more that they think about AEW, the more their own show is going to suffer. And everyone wants to point the finger at AEW for taking a little cheap shot at WWE every few weeks in a, in a little promo. Oh, look, AEW can't keep WWE out of their mouths. Oh, look, AEW has NXT on their minds. No, they don't. No, they fucking don't. There's a difference between mentioning another company and taking a shot at another company in a little promo versus actually booking a show and trying to put out a special event in order to take away from the other company show's audience. Major difference. AEW can take a shot here and there in a promo at NXT and or WWE here and there, but they're not putting out matches and their television show is not being affected by anything. They are focusing on their own show. They're focusing on their own superstars. They're building up their own feuds. They are building up their own storylines, and they're booking their own programming. A shot here or there means nothing. It's all about what they do on their show related to what the other show is doing, and they have not done anything to purposely try and counter-program NXT. Never. They've built up shows over the course of 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 weeks, whether it be special so shows on Dynamite or whether it be actual pay-per-views. Fighter Fest, they've been building up since Double or Nothing. They built the Fighter Fest on a Wednesday over the course of a two-week period. They built that up over the course of a month. Meanwhile, NXT just randomly announced the Great American Bash across a two-night two spread merely a week before the actual event. And you're going to tell me that that's not counter-programming? AEW has done nothing. They've done nothing to counter-program NXT. Not a single fucking thing. They have focused on building up their own shows. They have focused on building up their own talent. They have focused on building up towards their own pay-per-views. Meanwhile, every other fucking move that NXT makes on their show related to their superstars, their angles, their feuds, even their takeovers. Even their takeovers. Every other move that NXT makes has been to try to take away from AEW's audience and generate something that's going to bring NXT ratings. It's not how you run a fucking show. That's not how you book talent. First we had the Great American Bash. Then we had Halloween Havoc. Now we have New Year's Evil. I don't even know what the fuck a New Year's Evil is. At this rate, they're just putting a special name on an, on an NXT episode at the start of the new year just so they could get audience members to tune off of AEW and tune on NXT. Simple as that. They really need to stop with the AEW obsession. AEW is not obsess obsessed with WWE. A shot in a promo every few weeks or so, that ain't obsession. That ain't obsession. Blatantly booking special events on television and blatantly booking feuds and matches and title changes away on free television just for shock and awe like they did with Leon Ruff, that is blatant obsession with the competition. The WWE has done everything in their power. They have done so much that they possibly can to put AEW out of business, to try and prevent superstars from going to AEW, to pretty much try and take any luster away that they can from AEW. And they failed, but yet they continue to do it. It goes to show you that Vince McMahon sees NXT as nothing more than a counter-programming show. He doesn't care whether NXT fails or succeeds. He just wants to make sure that AEW's audience doesn't grow. And it's sad. Is it going to be a good show? It could be a good show. But it's nothing more than a counter-programming way. It's nothing more than a counter-programming device. It's nothing more than a counter-programming maneuver to get audience members to watch NXT over AEW. Will they win the ratings that one, that one night? Probably. Probably. 
So the main event, the main event, we had the Undisputed Era versus Pat McAfee, Pete Dunne, Oni Lorcan, and Danny Burch. This was the second War Games match. I've been hard on this storyline, rightfully so, because the storyline doesn't make sense. I said this, I said this a while back. Pat McAfee doesn't have a leg to stand on. Pat McAfee literally went out of his way and said that Adam Cole did not show me respect after I brought him to the limit at TakeOver at TakeOver 30. And I'm sitting there, I'm listening to this promo, and no matter how good Pat McAfee is on the microphone, I'm thinking to myself, dude, again, this is not a game of capture the flag. This is not a game of kickball in gym class with your second grade, third grade classmates. This is pro wrestling. You're not in grammar school. You are a fucking adult in the adult world. You ran your mouth, you had a match, and you had a chance to back up your words. And what happened? You failed. So you deal with that. You deal with that, you keep your mouth shut, and you move on. Adam Cole beats you. You have nothing to say. They legitimately just recycled the storyline from TakeOver 30 simply to get a War Games out there. And listen, I don't mind War Games being a yearly thing, but if you're not going to build up, if you're not going to build up a legitimate storyline, if you're not going to build up a legitimate angle that makes sense, if you're not going to build up a legitimate reason why a War Games match should be taking place and you're just going to recycle a storyline that we saw three, four months ago, then don't bother having War Games. It's the same reason why we rag on WWE for having Hell in a Cell and TLC and Extreme Rules and all of these gimmick pay-per-views and how many people say that these gimmick pay-per-views should die. It's the same reason here. If you're not going to give us a legitimate storyline and a legitimate reason to watch, then don't do a War Games show. The storyline did not make sense, but I will say this. The War Games match itself was fantastic. I will say that. We had Kyle O'Reilly and Pete Dunne starting the match for their teams. Um, they had a nice back and forth. Only Lorcan came in next. Dunne and Lorcan dissected O'Reilly. We had Bobby Fish coming in. He lit up Lorcan and Dunne. Danny Birch then came in next. He brought in a bag full of cricket bats, so they used them against O'Reilly. Strong came in next. He was hitting every, anything that moved. He was unloading on everyone before Pat McAfee came in. And he brought in some tables. And each table had the Undisputed Era logo on it and a name, a name of the Undisputed Era member. So we had one for Cole, we had one for Fish, we had one for Strong, we had one for O'Reilly. So Strong was then draped over the table and Pat McAfee with a beautiful, beautiful fucking moonsault sending Strong through the table. That looked great. McAfee, let me tell you something. The storyline doesn't make sense, and Pat McAfee should not even be on NXT television, but the guy has taken to pro wrestling like a fucking fish to water. He's great at what he does in the ring. He knows how to be a prick on the microphone, and he definitely knows how to fucking wrestle. And he does not wrestle like a usual heel does. He is a very, very good pro wrestler. He's a better fucking pro wrestler than, than Braun Strowman. Better fucking pro wrestler than Braun Strowman. So, after that beautiful moonsault, we had Cole coming in. He brought in a fire extinguisher. He then got a chair, and he used the chair to take out Dunn, Lorcan, and Birch. We then had a stare down between Cole and McAfee. Cole and Dunn got into it. We had a DDT counter of the bitter end. We got a big brawl with everyone. Lorcan and Birch then hit the draping DDT before Fish saved the match. Cole was then locked in a figure four before Cole reversed the pressure. All of the other six men were trying to keep each other at bay. Later on in the match, Adam Cole hit a knee drop brain buster to Pete Dunn for a two. And then the majority of the competitors were in the corner... We then had Dunn getting powerbombed onto Birch when Birch was on the table. The table didn't break. Strong with a flying splash onto Dunn, onto Birch, through the table. We then had Strong getting taken out. So Strong was out. Birch was out. Dunn was out. 
We then had McAfee getting shoved off the top rope, and he flew through the air, and he landed neck and head first through a table. So I'm surprised that he actually continued the matchup. That was beast of Pat McAfee. That could have gone wrong if not done right. We then had the Undisputed Era targeting the other three men. The other three men were pinned up against the cage, and we had a super kicks and flying forearms and jumping knees, and they were just dissecting all three men, and then they turned their attention to McAfee. They all swarmed McAfee. They sent Pat McAfee into the cage, one after the other, over and over. They took turns doing it. We had the rest of Team McAfee saving him. We get a neck breaker off of the top rope, on to Pete Dunne by Cole. We had a superplex by Strong to McAfee. We had another stare down, and we had a big brawl with all of the competitors except McAfee. McAfee, like a fucking lunatic, like someone who, who does not know how to fucking take care of himself, someone that doesn't care about his own fucking safety. Ma uh, Pat McAfee, Jeff Hardy style, with a swanton bomb off of the top of the cage, and no one fucking caught him. Reminded me of what happened with Bailey and Peyton Royce at Survivor Series. Nobody fucking caught him. It's like no one wants to fucking catch these guys. McAfee landed with a fucking thud. McAfee landed with a fucking thud. I'm surprised he continued. Matt McAfee took some sick fucking bumps in this match. McAfee had the, had the absolute piss beaten out of him in this match. Pat McAfee absolutely... Risking life and limb. I am legitimately surprised that his spine didn't fucking shatter. So he did a swanton bomb, landed on the pile. Done with a bitter end, but Kyle O'Reilly kicked out. Kyle O'Reilly then with a brain buster to Pete Dunne on the steel plate between the two rings. Looked brutal. They, everyone was beating the fucking shit out of each other. McAfee hit a low blow on Adam Cole. He missed the punt kick. We had a super kick to McAfee. Bobby Fish speared Danny Birch through a table that was propped in between the two rings. McAfee with a super kick. He went for the Panama Sunrise on Cole. Cole hit a super kick. And then he hit the Panama Sunrise, but Pat McAfee kicked out. He went for the last shot, but only Lorkin shoved McAfee out of the way. He took the bullet for McAfee. He took the bullet for McAfee. McAfee was then out. Lorkin got taken out, Pete Dunne set up a chair, and he hit a bitter end on the open chair with Adam Cole's chin and neck area going into the top of the chair, legitimately could have crushed his windpipe. There were some sick fucking bumps in both of the War Games matches, but Strong was able to save that. We had an end of heartache to Pete Dunne, we had the high-low combo on... Tony Lorcan, I believe it was, with a chair, and then O'Reilly off of the top rope with a knee drop to a chair across Lorcan's face. And Kyle O'Reilly pinned Oni Lorcan to win the War Games match. The match itself was awesome. I don't think it was better than the women's match. I still think the women had the best match of the night, but... This was a fantastic fucking War Games match right here. The ending sequence of the Undisputed Era just taking out all of the members one by one of Team McAfee, one after the other after the other was great. Again, the storyline did not make sense, but the match was fucking fantastic. And Pat McAfee, I'm telling you, he really, really, really shined in this match. He continues to fucking shine. Pat McAfee knows how to play the game when it comes to pro wrestling. But no matter how great Pat McAfee is, Pat McAfee... Now, he really doesn't have a leg to stand on. The nail has only been further driven into the coffin. Pat McAfee should not show his face on NXT television again. He should not show his face on NXT television again. No reason why Pat McAfee should be in a prime spot on NXT television. No reason why Pat McAfee should be on NXT television in any capacity. It's not what NXT needs. It's not what NXT is about. The show in itself overall was a great takeover. The show overall was a great takeover. It may go down as the second best takeover of the year. I don't care what anyone says. Nothing's going to top TakeOver Portland. TakeOver Portland, with that crowd a few weeks before this pandemic even started, that crowd absolutely brought every last ounce of energy that they had. That crowd was an excellent, excellent, excellent fucking crowd. 
awesome fucking crowd for TakeOver Portland. That will absolutely, absolutely fucking lootly go down as the best TakeOver of 2020. But War Games, they did an admirable job. It was a great TakeOver. You had some awesome wrestling. The build sucked. The build sucked, but the show overall was a damn good show. But it, it just sucks. It just sucks that no matter what, no matter what happens, it just sucks that the love, the the luster, the the mystique, the aura of NXT is never going to be rebuilt. The buzz around NXT is not going to be rekindled. It's going to take it's going to take so long to rekindle this love, to rekindle this this mystique for NXT, all because all because Vince McMahon wanted to take over and have his influence all over NXT, all because Vince McMahon is now calling the shots here and there. And I still don't believe Triple H has allowed that to happen. He's just sitting there like a good boy with his hands folded in, with his hands folded on his desk, and he doesn't even realize the power that he possessed. I talked about this on the Lightning Flash update, where Triple H, he's the only one that could really stand up to Vince McMahon because Vince McMahon's not going to fire him. Vince McMahon can't fire Triple H because if he does, his daughter ain't going to be happy. Yes, Vince McMahon's daughter may be his daughter. Stephanie may be Vince's daughter, but she's also the mother of Triple H's three kids. And if Triple H can't work and provide money for his children, Stephanie ain't gonna be fucking happy. Stephanie is going to fucking speak up and say something to her father. It doesn't matter whether Stephanie is Vince's daughter or not. She is Triple H's husband, and if Triple H gets fired by Vince McMahon, Stephanie ain't gonna be happy. Vince isn't gonna fire his son-in-law for that reason alone. So Triple H is realistically the only guy that can actually stand up to Vince McMahon and actually not get fired. He's the only guy that can actually do what no one else has been able to do. He's the only one that can actually incite change, and I don't understand why he hasn't even realized that. I don't believe that Triple H has allowed this to happen. It was a great takeover. Great takeover. May go down as the best takeover of the year, but it just sucks that... This is not going to give any buzz to NXT. It's not going to rekindle a love for NXT. It's not going to do anything, no matter how damn good the show was. And it was a damn good show. It doesn't matter. And that's sad. Of course, I will still be covering NXT. I'm still a fan of NXT. I truthfully hope that the dark days of NXT are coming to an end. Although I don't really have any faith. I can only hope for a better year for NXT in 2021. Although, this is the WWE, and I really don't have much faith in them. But ladies and gentlemen, that wraps up this edition of The Rewind. That wraps up The Rewind for NXT TakeOver War Games 2020. I'd like to thank each and every single one of you who tuned into this video. I greatly appreciate each and every single one of you. Please, please, please check out all the links in the description. Follow me on all platforms of social media. Like, comment, and subscribe. Check out the Lightning Flash Update course links in the description if you missed it check out everything that i just said i greatly appreciate all of you thank you thank you very much for making the dj storms brand a huge resounding success thank you for 50,000 plus views thank you for watching the rundown with matt moody thank you for watching the lending flesh update if you already watched the lending flesh update i will be live tweeting tonight and of course note taking for monday night raw we had a great NXT TakeOver Weekend. We are getting set for another week of wrestling programming. Of course, I will be working this week. The holidays are rapidly approaching, so please, please, please go out there, get your Christmas shopping done, wear your damn masks, sanitize your hands. You already know the drill. I'm DJ Storms. This has been the Rewind for NXT TakeOver War Games 4. I will catch you guys later tonight for Monday Night Raw. You guys stay safe. And you guys have an awesome day.